Found Edge by Isaac Asimov Audiobook 22 of 26 My consciousness is far advanced beyond that of any individual cell incredibly far, adva far advanced. The fact that we, in turn, are part of a still greater group consciousness on a higher level does not reduce us to the level of cells. I remain a human being but above us is a group consciousness as far beyond my grasp as my consciousness is beyond that of one of the muscle cells of my biceps. Trevis said, surely someone ordered our ship to be taken. No, not someone. Gaia ordered it. All of us ordered it. The trees and the ground, too, bliss. They contributed very little, but they contributed. Look, if a musician writes a symphony, do you ask which particular cell in his body ordered the symphony written and supervised its construction? Polorit said, and, I dot take it, the group mind, so to speak, of the group consciousness is much stronger than an individual mind, just as a muscle is much stronger than an individual muscle cell. Consequently Gaia can capture our ship at a distance by controlling our computer, even though no individual mind on the planet could have done so. You understand perfectly, Pell, said Bliss. And I understand it, too, said Trevis. It is not that hard to understand. But what do you want of us? We have not come to attack you. We have come seeking information. Why have you seized us? To talk to you. You might have talked to us on the ship. Bliss shook her head gravely, I am not the one to do it. Aren't you part of the group mind? Yes, but I cannot fly like a bird, buzz like an insect, or grow as tall as a tree. I do what it is best for me to do and it is not best that I give you the information though the knowledge could easily be assigned to me. Who decided not to assign it to you? We all did. Who will give us the information? And who is D.O.M.? Well, said Bliss. His full name is Endomandio Vizomarandia so and so on. Different people call him different syllables at different times, but I know him as D.O.M. and I think you too will use that syllable as well. He probably has a larger share of Gaia than anyone on the planet and he lives on this island. He asked to see you and it was allowed. Who allowed it? Asked Trevisan answered himself at once, Yes, I know, you all did. Bliss nodded. Polorit said, When will we be seeing D.O.M., Bliss? Right away. If you follow me, I'll take you to him now, Pell. And you, too, of course, Trev. And will you leave, then? Asked Polorit. You don't want me to, Pell. Actually, no. There you are, said Bliss as they followed her along a smoothly paved road that skirted the orchard. Men grow addicted to me on short order. Even dignified elderly men are overcome with boyish ardor. Polorit laughed. I wouldn't count on much boyish ardor, Bliss, but if I had it I could do worse than have it on your account, I think. Bliss said, oh, don't discount your boyish ardor. I work wonders. Trevi said impatiently, once we get to where we're going, how long will we have to wait for this D.O.M.? He will be waiting for you. After all, D.O.M. through Gaia has worked for years to bring you here. Trevi stopped in midstep and looked quickly at Polorit, who quietly mouthed. You were right. Bliss who was looking straight ahead, said calmly, I know, Trev, that you have suspected that I slash we slash Gaia was interested in you. I slash we slash Gaia, said Polorit softly. She turned to smile at him. We have a whole complex of different pronouns to express the shades of individuality that exist on Gaia. I could explain them to you, but till then I slash we slash Gaia gets across what I mean in a groping sort of way. Please move on, Trev. 
D.O.M. is waiting and I don't wish to force your legs to move against your will. It is an uncomfortable feeling if you are not used to it. Trevise moved on. His glance at Bliss was compounded of the deepest suspicion. D.O.M. was an elderly man. He recited the 253 syllables of his name in a musical flowing of tone and emphasis. In a way, he said, it is a brief biography of myself. It tells the hearer or reader, or censor who I am, what part I have played in the whole, what I have accomplished. For fifty years and more, however, I have been satisfied to be referred to as D.O.M. When there are other doms at issue, I can be called Dumandio and in my various professional relationships other variants are used. Once again year. On my birthday my full name is recited in mind, as I have just recited it for you in voice. It is very effective, but it is personally embarrassing. He was tall and thin almost to the point of emaciation. His deep-set eyes sparkled with anomalous youth, though he moved rather slowly. His jutting nose was thin and long and flared at the nostrils. His hands, prominently veined though they were, showed no signs of arthritic disability. He wore a long robe that was as grey as his hair. It descended to his ankles and his sandals left his toes bare. Trevise said, How old are you, sir? Please address me as D.O.M., Trev. To use other modes of address induces formality and inhibits the free exchange of ideas between you and me. In galactic standard years, I am just past 93, but the real celebration will come not very many months from now, when I reach the 90th anniversary of my birth in Gaian years. I would not have guessed you at more than 75, S.D.O.M., said Trevis. By Gaian standards I am not remarkable, either in years or in appearance of years, Trev. But come, have we eaten? Pelorit looked down at his plate, on which perceptible remnants of a most unremarkable and indifferently prepared meal remained, and said in a diffident manner, D.O.M., may I attempt to ask an embarrassing question? Of course, if it's offensive, you will please say so, and I will withdraw it. Go ahead, said D.O.M., smiling. I am anxious to explain to you anything about Gaia which arouses your curiosity. Why? said Trevise at once. Because you are honored guests may I have Pell's question. Pelorit said, since all things on Gaia share in the group consciousness, how is it that you one element of the group can eat this, which was clearly another element? True. But all things recycle. We must eat and everything we can eat, plant as well as animal even the inanimate seasonings are part of Gaia. But, then, you see, nothing is killed for pleasure or sport, nothing is killed with unnecessary pain. And I'm afraid we make no attempt to glorify our meal preparations, for no Gaian would eat except that one must. You did not enjoy this meal, pal? Trev? Well, meals are not to enjoy. Then, too, what is eaten remains, after all, part of the planetary consciousness. Insofar as portions of it are incorporated into my body, it will participate in a larger share of the total consciousness. When I die, I, too, will be eaten even if only by decay bacteria and I will then participate in a far smaller share of the total. But someday, parts of me will be parts of other human beings, parts of many. Pelorit said, a sort of transmigration of souls. Of what, Pell? I speak of an old myth that is current on some worlds. Ah, I don't know of it. You must tell me on some occasion. Trevis said, but your individual consciousness whatever it is about you that is D.O.M. will never fully reassemble. No, of course not. But does that matter? I will still be part of Gaia and that is what counts. There are mystics among us who wonder if we should take measures to develop group memories of past existences, 
but the sense of Gaia is that this cannot be done in any practical way and would serve no useful purpose. It would merely blur present consciousness. Of course, as conditions change, the sense of Gaia may change, too, but I find no chance of that in the foreseeable future. Why must you die, D.O.M.? Asked Trevise. Look at you in your nineties. Could not the group consciousness for the first time, D.O.M. frowned. Never, he said. I can contribute only so much. Each new individual is a reshuffling of molecules and genes into something new. New talents, new abilities, new contributions to Gaia. We must have them and the only way we can is to make room. I have done more than most, but even I have my limit and it is approaching. There is no more desire to live past one's time than to die before it. And then, as if realizing he had lent a suddenly somber note to the evening, he rose and stretched his arms out to the two. Come, Trevpel let us move into my studio where I can show you some of my personal art objects. You won't blame an old man for his little vanities, I hope. He led the way into another room where, on a small circular table, there were a group of smoky lenses connected in pairs. These, said D.O.M., are participations I have designed. I am not one of the masters, but I specialize in inanimates, which few of the masters bother with. Polorit said, may I pick one up? Are they fragile? No, no. Bounce them on the floor if you like. Or perhaps you had better not. Concussion could dull the sharpness of the vision. How are they used, D.O.M.? You put them over your eyes. They'll cling. They do not transmit light. Quite the contrary. They obscure light that might otherwise distract you though the sensations do reach your brain by way of the optic nerve. Essentially your consciousness is sharpened and is allowed to participate in other facets of Gaia. In other words, if you look at that wall, you will experience that wall as it appears to itself. Fascinating, muttered Polorit. May I try that? Certainly, Pell. You may take one at random. Each is a different construct that shows the Wally or any other inanimate object you look at in a different aspect of the object's consciousness. Polorid placed one pair over his eyes and they clung there at once. He started at the touch and then remained motionless for a long time. D.O.M. said, when you are through, place your hands on either side of the participation and press them toward each other. It will come right off. Polorid did so, blinked his eyes rapidly, then rubbed them. D.O.M. said, what did you experience? Polorid said, it's hard to describe. The wall seemed to twinkle and glisten and, at times, it seemed to turn fluid. It seemed to have ribs and changing symmetries. I, I am sorry, D.O.M., but I did not find it attractive. D.O.M. sighed. You do not participate in Gaia, so you would not see what we see. I had rather feared that. Too bad. I assure you that although these participations are enjoyed primarily for their aesthetic value, they have their practical uses, too. A happy wall is a long-lived wall, a practical wall, a useful wall. A happy wall. Said Trevise, smiling slightly. D.O.M. said, there is a dim sensation that a wall experiences that is analogous to what happy means to us. A wall is happy when it is well designed, when it rests firmly on its foundation, when its symmetry balances its parts and produces no unpleasant stresses. Good design can be worked out on the mathematical principles of mechanics, but the use of a proper participation can fine-tune it down to virtually atomic dimensions. No sculptor can possibly produce a first-class work of art here on Gaia without a well-crafted participation and the ones I produce of this particular type are considered excellent if I do say so myself. Animate participations, which are not my field, 
and D.O.M. was going on with the kind of excitement one expects in someone writing his hobby, give us, by analogy, a direct experience of ecological balance. The ecological balance on Gaia is rather simple, as it is on all worlds, but here, at least, we have the hope of making it more complex and thus enriching the total consciousness enormously. Trevis held up his hand in order to forestall Pelorit and wave him into silence. He said, how do you know that a planet can bear a more complex ecological balance if they all have simple ones? Ah, said D.O.M., his eyes twinkling shrewdly, you are testing the old man. You know as well as I do that the original home of humanity, Earth, had an enormously complex ecological balance. It is only the secondary worlds the derived worlds that are simple. Polorit would not be kept silent. But that is the problem I have set myself in life. Why was it only Earth that bore a complex ecology? What distinguished it from other worlds? Why did millions upon millions of other worlds in the galaxy worlds that were capable of bearing life develop only an undistinguished vegetation, together with small and unintelligent animal life forms? D.O.M. said, we have a tale about that a fable, perhaps. I cannot vouch for its authenticity. In fact, on the face of it, it sounds like fiction. It was at this point that Bliss who had not participated in the meal entered, smiling at Polorit. She was wearing a silvery blouse, very sheer. Polorit rose at once. I thought you had left us. Not at all. I had reports to make out, work to do. May I join you now, D.O.M.? D.O.M. had also risen, though Trevise remained seated. You are entirely welcome and you ravish these aged eyes. It is for your ravishment that I put on this blouse. Pell is above such things and Trev dislikes them. Polorit said, if you think I am above such things, Bliss, I may surprise you someday. What a delightful surprise that would be, Bliss said, and sat down. The two men did as well. Please don't let me interrupt you. D.O.M. said, I was about to tell our guests the story of eternity. To understand it, you must first understand that there are many different universes that can exist virtually an infinite number. Every single event that takes place can take place or not take place, or can take place in this fashion or in that fashion, and each of an enormous number of alternatives will result in a future course of events that are distinct to at least some degree. Bliss might not have come in just now, or she might have been with us a little earlier, or much earlier, or having come in now, she might have worn a different blouse, or even in this blouse, she might not have smiled roguishly at elderly men as is her kind-hearted custom. In each of these alternatives or in each of a very large number of other alternatives of this one event the universe would have taken a different track thereafter, and so on for every other variation of every other event however minor. Trevi stirred restlessly. I believe this is a common speculation in quantum mechanics a very ancient one, in fact. Ah, you've heard of it. But let us go on. Imagine it is possible for human beings to freeze all the infinite number of universes, to step from one to another at will, and to choose which one should be made real whatever that word means in this connection. Trevi said, I hear your words and can even imagine the concept you describe, but I cannot make myself believe that anything like this could ever happen. Nor I, on the whole, said D.O.M., which is why I say that it would all seem to be a fable. Nevertheless, the fable states that there were those who could step out of time and examine the endless strands of potential reality. These people were called the Eternals and when they were out of time they were said to be in eternity. It was their task to choose a reality that would be most suitable to humanity. They modified endlessly and the story goes into great detail, for I must tell you that it has been written in the form of an epic of inordinate length. Eventually they found, so it is said, a universe in which Earth was the only planet in the entire galaxy on which could be found a complex ecological system, 
together with the development of an intelligent species capable of working out a high technology. That, they decided, was the situation in which humanity could be most secure. They froze that strand of events as reality and then ceased operations. Now we live in a galaxy that has been settled by human beings only, and, to a large extent, by the plants, animals and microscopic life that they carry with them voluntarily or inadvertently from planet to planet and which usually overwhelm the indigenous life. Somewhere in the dim mists of probability there are other realities in which the galaxy is host to many intelligences, but they are unreachable. We in our reality are alone. From every action and every event in our reality, there are new branches that set off, with only one in each separate case being a continuation of reality, so that there are vast numbers of potential universes perhaps an infinite number stemming from ours, but all of them are presumably alike in containing the one intelligence galaxy in which we live. Or perhaps I should say that all but a vanishingly small percentage are alike in this way, for it is dangerous to rule out anything where the possibilities approach the infinite. He stopped, shrugged slightly, and added, at least, that's the story. It dates back to before the founding of Gaia. I don't vouch for its truth. The three others had listened intently. Bliss nodded her head, as though it were something she had heard before and she were checking the accuracy of Dom's account. Polorit reacted with a silent solemnity for the better part of a minute and then balled his fist and brought it down upon the arm of his chair. No, he said is a strangled tone, that affects nothing. There's no way of demonstrating the truth of the story by observation or by reason, so it can't ever be anything but a piece of speculation, but aside from that suppose it's true. The universe we live in is still one in which only Earth has developed a rich life and an intelligent species, so that in this universe whether it is the all-in-all -all or only one out of an infinite number of possibilities there must be something unique in the nature of the planet Earth. We should still want to know what that uniqueness is. In the silence that followed, it was Trevise who finally stirred and shook his head. No, Janov, he said. That's not the way it works. Let us say that the chances are one in a billion trillion one in IO21 that out of the billion of habitable planets in the galaxy only Earth through the workings of sheer chance would happen to develop a rich ecology and, eventually, intelligence. If that is so, then one in 1021 of the various strands of potential realities would represent such a galaxy and the Eternals picked it. We live, therefore, in a universe in which Earth is the only planet to develop a complex ecology, an intelligent species, a high technology not because there is something special about Earth, but because simply by chance it developed on Earth and nowhere else. I suppose, in fact, Trevise went on thoughtfully, that there are strands of reality in which only Gaia has developed an intelligent species, or only says Hell, or only Terminus or only some planet which in this reality happens to bear no life at all. And all of these very special cases are a vanishingly small percentage of the total number of realities in which there is more than one intelligent species in the galaxy. I suppose that if the Eternals had looked long enough they would have found a potential strand of reality in which every single habitable planet had developed an intelligent species. Polorit said, might you not also argue that a reality had been found in which Earth was for some reason not as it was in other strands, but specially suited in some way for the development of intelligence? In fact, you can go further and say that a reality had been found in which the whole galaxy was not as it was in other strands, but was somehow in such a state of development that only Earth could produce intelligence. Trevis said, you might argue so but I would suppose that my version makes more sense. That's a purely subjective decision, of course began Polorit with some heat, but D.O.M. interrupted, saying this is logic shopping. Come, let us not spoil what is proving, at least for me, a pleasant and leisurely evening. Polorit endeavored to relax and to allow his heat to drain away. He smiled finally and said, as you say, D.O.M. Trevise, 
who had been casting glances at Bliss, who sat with mocking demurity, hands in her lap, now said, And how did this world come to be, D.O.M.? Gaia, with its group consciousness. Dom's old head leaned back and he laughed in a high-pitched manner. His face crinkled as he said, Fables again. I think about that sometimes, when I read what records we have on human history. No matter how carefully records are kept and filed and computerized, they grow fuzzy with time. Stories grow by accretion. Tales accumulate like dust. The longer the time lapse, the dustier the history until it degenerates into fables. Polorit said, We historians are familiar with the process, D.O.M. There is a certain preference for the fable. The falsely dramatic drives out the truly dull, said Liebel Generat about 15 centuries ago. It's called Generat's Law now. Is it? said D.O.M. And I thought the notion was a cynical invention of my own. Well, Generat's Law fills our past history with glamour and uncertainty. Do you know what a robot is? We found out on Says Hell, said Trevise dryly. You saw one? No. We were asked the question and, when we answered in the negative, it was explained to us. I understand. Humanity once lived with robots, you know, but it didn't work well. So we were told. The robots were deeply indoctrinated with what are called the three laws of robotics, which date back into prehistory. There are several versions of what those three laws might have been. The orthodox view has the following reading. 1. A robot may not harm a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 3. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. As robots grew more intelligent and versatile, they interpreted these laws, especially the all-overriding first, more and more generously and assumed, to a greater and greater degree, the role of protector of humanity. The protection stifled people and grew unbearable. The robots were entirely kind. Their labors were clearly humane and were meant entirely for the benefit of all which somehow made them all the more unbearable. Every robotic advance made the situation worse. Robots were developed with telepathic capacity, but that meant that even human thought could be monitored, so that human behavior became still more dependent on robotic oversight. Again robots grew steadily more like human beings in appearance but they were unmistakably robots in behavior and being humanoid made them more repulsive. So, of course, it had to come to an end. Why of course? Asked Polorit, who had been listening intently. D.O.M. said, it's a matter of following the logic to the bitter end. Eventually the robots grew advanced enough to become just sufficiently human to appreciate why human beings should resent being deprived of everything human in the name of their own good. In the long run, the robots were forced to decide that humanity might be better off caring for themselves, however carelessly and ineffectively. Therefore, it is said, it was the robots who established eternity somehow and became the Eternals. They located a reality in which they felt that human beings could be as secure as possible alone in the galaxy. Then, having done what they could to guard us and in order to fulfill the first law in the truest sense, the robots of their own accord ceased to function and ever since we have been human beings advancing, however we can, alone. D.O.M. paused. He looked from Trevise to Polorit, and then said, Well, do you believe all that? Trevise shook his head slowly. No. There is nothing like this in any historical record I have ever heard of. How about you, Janov? Polorit said, there are myths that are similar in some ways. Come, Janov, there are myths that would match anything that any of us can make up, given sufficiently ingenious interpretation. 
I'm talking about history reliable records. Oh well. Nothing there, as far as I know. D.O.M. said, I'm not surprised. Before the robots withdrew, many parties of human beings left to colonize robotless worlds in deeper space, in order to take their own measures for freedom. They came particularly from overcrowded Earth, with its long history of resistance to robots. The new worlds were founded fresh and they did not even want to remember their bitter humiliation as children under robot nursemaids. They kept no records of it and they forgot. Trevis said, this is unlikely. Pallorid turned to him. No, Golan. It's not at all unlikely. Societies create their own history and tend to wipe out lowly beginnings, either by forgetting them or inventing totally fictitious heroic rescues. The imperial government made attempts to suppress knowledge of the pre-imperial past in order to strengthen the mystic aura of eternal rule. Then, too, there are almost no records of the days before hyperspatial travel and you know that the very existence of Earth is unknown to most people today. Trevis said, you can't have it both ways, Janov. If the galaxy has forgotten the robots, how is it that Gaia remembers? Bliss intervened with a sudden lilt of soprano laughter. We're different. Yes. Said Trevis. In what way? D.O.M. said, Now, Bliss, leave this to me. We are different, men of Terminus. Of all the refugee groups fleeing from robotic domination, we who eventually reached Gaia, following in the track of others who reached Seshel, were the only ones who had learned the craft of telepathy from the robots. It is a craft, you know. It is inherent in the human mind, but it must be developed in a very subtle and difficult manner. It takes many generations to reach its full potential, but once well begun, it feeds on itself. We have been at it for over 20,000 years and the sense of Gaia is that full potential has even now not been reached. It was long ago that our development of telepathy made us aware of group consciousness first only of human beings, then animals, then plants, and finally, not many centuries ago, the inanimate structure of the planet itself. Because we traced this back to the robots, we did not forget them. We considered them not our nursemaids but our teachers. We felt they had opened our mind to something we would never for one moment want them closed to. We remember them with gratitude. Trevis said, but just as once you were children to the robots, now you are children to the group consciousness. Have you not lost humanity now, as you had then? It is different, Trev. What we do now is our own choice our own choice. That is what counts. It is not forced on us from outside, but is developed from the inside. It is something we never forget. And we are different in another way, too. We are unique in the galaxy. There is no world like Gaia. How can you be sure? We would know, Trev. We would detect a world consciousness such as ours even at the other end of the galaxy. We can detect the beginnings of such a consciousness in your second foundation, for instance, though not until two centuries ago. At the time of the mule. Yes. One of ours. D.O.M. looked grim. He was an aberrant and he left us. We were naive enough to think that was not possible, so we did not act in time to stop him. Then, when we turned our attention to the outside worlds, we became aware of what you call the second foundation and we left it to them. Trevi stared blankly for several moments, then muttered, There go our history books. He shook his head and said in a louder tone of voice, that was rather cowardly of Gaia, wasn't it, to do so? Said Trevis. He was your responsibility. You are right. But once we finally turned our eyes upon the galaxy, we saw what until then we had been blind to, so that the tragedy of the mule proved a life-saving matter to us. 
It was then that we recognized that eventually a dangerous crisis would come upon us. And it has but not before we were able to take measures, thanks to the incident of the mule. What sort of crisis? One that threatens us with destruction. I can't believe that. You held off the empire, the mule, and says how. You have a group consciousness that can pluck a ship out of space at a distance of millions of kilometers. What can you have to fear? Look at Bliss. She doesn't look the least bit perturbed. She doesn't think there's a crisis. Bliss had placed one shapely leg over the arm of the chair and wriggled her toes at him. Of course I'm not worried, Trev. You'll handle it. Trev said forcefully, me. D.O.M. said, Gaia has brought you here by means of a hundred gentle manipulations. It is you who must face our crisis. Trev stared at him and slowly his face turned from stupefaction into gathering rage. Me? Why, in all of space, me? I have nothing to do with this. Nevertheless, Trev, said D.O.M. with an almost hypnotic calmness, you. Only you. In all of space, only you. 18. Collision store Gendebel was edging toward Gaia almost as cautiously as Trevise had and now that its star was a perceptible disk and could be viewed only through strong filters, he paused to consider. Surin Novi sat to one side, looking up at him now and then in a timorous manner. She said softly, Master. What is it, Novi? He asked abstractedly. Are you unhappy? He looked up at her quickly. No. Concerned. Remember that word? I am trying to decide whether to move in quickly or to wait longer. Shall I be very brave, Novi? I think you are very brave all times, Master. To be very brave is sometimes to be foolish. Novi smiled. How can a master scholar be foolish? That is a son, is it not, master? She pointed to the screen. Gendable nodded. Novi said, after an irresolute pause, is it the sun that shines on Trantor? Is it the Hamish sun? Gendable said, no, Novi. It is a far different sun. There are many suns, billions of them. Ah. I had known this with my head. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.